Okay, welcome, welcome back to the Spiritual Seas podcast. We are back the, with the the next episode where we are going to discuss the end of the fourth chapter. Or uh, yeah, 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 yeah concluding. Okay. All right. So, uh, let's start, Spiriti. So. Thank you, Kanan. Very happy to be back. Sorry for letting you down last week. No, and that's fine. This, fine. this month, so I think it will only be alternate weeks. And then because mm. March is busy for other reasons, financial, the festival Gaurav Purnima is coming next week, Thursday, Friday. But after that, we can get back on track to every week. I really look forward to these podcasts. So, uh, yeah, we were, we last uh, class a uh, couple of weeks ago on chapter four, we were talking of the two crucial verses. One is, of course, the one that talks about four casts, the Chatur Varnyam verse, the 13th verse. And the other one was the 34th verse, which talks about uh, the absolute need to accept uh, a spiritual guru, a spiritual mm. master, 34th verse. And how the two are in one sense, these two verses are connected because these four castes, which is discussed briefly in the 13th verse, Chatur Varnyam Maya Srishti, that mm. one starts not as it's grossly and horribly misunderstood today as by birth or birthright. Mm. It's not meant to, it's meant to be according to a natural inclination. So how do we decide uh, what our natural inclination is in a definitive way? We actually need a spiritual master who interacts mm. with us, engages us in different uh, um, activities and then decides or comes and uh, c- concludes and tells us, this is what you're best at, how do you feel and so on. So these two verses are connected. The next, uh, today we're going to look at a couple of other verses which are also very uh, like, um, uh, they are very uh, striking for uh, the direction they give in this in this same chapter. Mm-hmm. One is the 11th verse and the other one is the 31st verse. So what we're going to look at today is the 11th verse and then the 31st verse. And then we are going to look at uh, one of the initial verses that talks about five, six different types of incarnations or avatars, uh, which the Lord comes down in and looks specifically at one pastime or leela, which comes in the eighth canto of the Bhagavata, which is the churning of the milk ocean, where the Lord incarnates multi times, multiple times, not just once, to help out the demigods in their battle against the demons. So this is going to be our plan, like lesson plan for today. So first, with the 11th verse, if you want to scroll, I I'm, I don't need it, I have my book here. But okay. later for you. Is it yeah, this one? You, this one, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah tam, mam, yante, that's that one. Hmm. Which is, do you want to read out the translation, if you like? Yeah, yeah, sure. So... This one, right? As all surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects. O son of uh, Prita. Yes, Prita is referring to Arjuna. As all surrender unto me. Here, what it meant is I reward them accordingly. Uh, mm. To the degree and the type of surrender that you show. And that, mind you, is not fixed. It's, uh, it is uh, flexible and it, it evolves. You mm. can show more surrender. You can lose some of your faith and surrender and so on. Uh, initially your surrender may be tinged with a lot of fear of reactions and then as you get to know the Lord and you have many experiences or you practice regularly that fear element goes down so Mm. this surrender is something that evolves and according to the degree of surrender I reward them accordingly he is saying he is always there as super soul in the heart hearing sensing what we need when we need it and uh, sometimes putting tests in front of us, at other times sending a helping hand so that we don't lose our faith completely because of the dire circumstances we find ourselves in. So this is a crucial verse. And if you look at the, uh, the purport, uh, he is saying here, uh, Srila Prabhupada's commentary, which is explaining different categories of people who surrender is of different types. And mm. even if we read the whole thing, if I just summarize, uh, I can tell you that um, invariably the reader or the listener will find ourselves in one of these categories or in more than one such category. So he's saying because he's there as 
the super soul he knows and mind you the super soul is accompanying the jiva but that's us mm. life life in different bodies and different births so he knows what we did last birth and what we aspired for last birth and that's why often we feel um like something that you know we have seen before we have been here before these are memories perhaps coming from previous lives and it's up to the super soul to remove that curtain and sometimes give us a glimpse of something and then the curtain comes down again so so also with the faith we hope for or aspired for nothing goes unheard what's happening good or bad inside the heart so he says here uh, according to one's desire i i that is krishna is reciprocating with his devotees one devotee here first if you even if you don't find that uh, section in here that's all right one devotee may want krishna as a supreme master another as his personal friend another as his son and still another as his lover so this is straight away these two lines in the purport or the sentence is taking us into the five different types of bhavas or the rasas or the mood in which a devotee may gradually find himself being interested in or attracted to the lord so uh, this information itself is uh, is pretty unusual for it to be given in the bhagavad gita but uh, shila prabhupada is always trying to take the bhagavad gita verses and give them like you can say an upgrade or uplift so that the reader who reads reads what krishna himself says and he gets a little more so that if he is interested in climbing upward and inquiring more he, this will immediately lead him or get him to start thinking about what's happening in the bhagavatam because the bhagavatam has devotees uh, showing these different moods or bhavas or rasas so the the most basic type of bhava or rasa is called the shantaras meaning in the shantaras uh the devotee is too scared to express any emotion and he's got lot of respect and he's got faith but uh, that's it there's nothing more than that in the next ras there is dasya ras which is referred to here that the devotee is not so scared it's still a very receive mood which is good but uh, he wants to do some things for the lord so his mood is that of a servant or a servitor and hanuman is a perfect example you know dasya or dasa of uh, lord ram ramachandra uh, in uh, it's, it's sometimes it's taken to be a progressive so from dasya next comes the sakyaras which is in terms of its value there is definitely a hierarchy indicated here so basic is the shantaras next is the dasyaras then is the sakyaras or where the devotee likes to interact with the lord a feelings of uh, friendship brotherhood now for example with arjuna and krishna it was sakyaras with krishna and all the gopakumaras and the gopas it was sakyaras is friendship it's i mean they could thump him on the back at least when he was a child they could share his lunch pack they could eat up it's like what we do in school mm. i mean not downgrade to our common level but so that's all it's a remarkable thing about the bhakti path and uh, uh, those who you know gone more deep into this i have asked this question that what is your innate aptitude or inclination towards the lord can this be changed so this is a tricky question uh, and the answer i got was apparently the same question as asked to uh, prabhupad the thing is that particular type of interaction or a worship of the lord satisfies us so fully that we wouldn't want to change it this is the whole point krishna has made so much allowance for variety of the different souls interest in him we live today in such an impersonal and uh, it's like the mall the supermarkets and the mall culture everything is same same you know one product you find uh, say a garment you can find 10 more 10 more items exactly like that and it is this modern impersonal you are expected uh, parents have a certain idea what you have to be and then you just fall into that slot society already dims into what is their 
template for a successful life and you are supposed to just generally fall into that. You get at this stage, you get into this kind of professional college, at the next stage, you get into this particular company. It has to be Ernst and Young or it has to be whatever else. And otherwise it's not good enough like that. At this stage, you have to migrate to America and so on. But uh, uh, you can see from the Lord that his dealings with the jivas are completely the opposite. He has uh, made so much room for variety, variegatedness, to the extent that even in the emotions that his devotees are semi or non, whatever feel for him, uh, he has made so much allowance. One may feel constantly in one way and one someone else. So Sakya is like what the Pandavas feel for the Lord, particularly Arjuna, and then the Gopas who go out to mind, to mind the cows into the forest, who go with uh, Krishna. It is Sakya. Then comes Vatsalya Bhav, that is even higher in the hierarchy. The Vatsalya Ras is, of course, prime example, Nanda Maharaj, Yashoda Mai, to baby Krishna. That's always, they feel they are his protector. And they are so scared of anything happening to him. They completely forget that this is the Lord himself. So, uh, or this is the Supreme Person. Occasionally, that Leela, for the sake of contrast, and to intensify the emotions, occasionally something intrudes into that ongoing pastime between Yashoda Mai and the mother. Like when she runs after him with a stick or she catches him eating mud and she opens his mouth and sees the uh, universes inside, she faints. And that sight is so frighteningly majestic and powerful because briefly she realizes or she's, her, uh, her, uh, her maternal affections that flow you know, she's running after him. She wants to feed him. She's getting his food ready. She's chasing him with a stick like a mother would do with a child, not a child. But when she is um, forced to open his mouth to pull out the mud he swallowed and she sees all these universes, it's like she faints because it's a completely different bhav that comes in. It's a, he, she suddenly realizes this is the Supreme Lord, Supreme Personality. And when she comes back to her consciousness, she has no memory of that incident. She's back to being the mother chasing and being very angry and all that. So that is the Vatsalya Ras. And then, of course, is Madhurya Ras that is considered so elevated with the risk of even trying to understand or explain it uh, we, we, is great. I mean, we run the risk of dragging it down and this happens all the time on the WhatsApp messages that are exchanged. We drag down that uh, spiritual and transcendental strong and intense love between Radha and Krishna who were just as like small children age-wise. We drag it down to our mundane level of our attractions and the lust and the possessiveness and the greed and so many other horrible emotions that are there. WhatsApp messages are all the time. Come women say they will try to catch hold of some figure from the Shastras and screw some meaning out of it which never existed. So what this, this social media, they don't know what is what. They don't even know the difference between material and spiritual. So Madhurya Ras is topmost most intense um, that involves basically Radha and Krishna. And just one uh, point to note, if you see, for example, in Madhvacharya system and the Udupi temples and many Krishna temples, you will hardly ever or never ever find a Radha next to Krishna. It's very rare. But every Iskon temple that you go to invariably has Radha and Krishna. Then they may have Jagannath Baladeya Subhadra. That's different. Uh, but that Radha Krishna worship, because that is the highest that is on offer for ISKCON devotees or any devotee who takes inspiration from all this knowledge and who is practicing regularly and advancing. Now, may, some there are some who don't want it. This is the interesting thing. They are not moved or um, they it, it doesn't resonate with them. The Radha Krishna duo. That but uh, the, that uh, that kind of uh, like relate like that kind of uh, let's say relationship with Krishna is like is that only possible if it's like the opposite gender or is it like uh, no, like, no, what is not, it like no not at all no. that is because we're still thinking in, within our material frame you know okay. I am a female and therefore I should not no it is the attraction between them okay, okay. It is the oh it's the attraction between them between Radha and Krishna that surpasses like you know uh, oh it's 
much. I don't think I, I am equipped even to get into it. But the, uh, the times between them and the sweetness of that ras, the Madhurya ras, for us, invariably, if we get attracted to that, what happens is, uh, I have seen this happen repeatedly in places like Vrindavan, where they uh, assume things about themselves and fall into some womanly attraction trap at the mundane level. They presume and fake that they think they are Krishna himself and their love for a particular woman in their circumstances is on that plane. That's what I meant. That's the kind of blunder that happens and vice versa. Women also do this. So that's the highest. So but uh, so in this where Krishna is saying that I reward them accordingly, that depending on the nature or the flavor of your attraction and interest for the Supreme Lord, he will fulfill completely and accept it. It's not like he discriminates and demeans one and uh, uh, rewards one more accordingly, more uh, high, in a higher way. It's not like that at all. Next is where I think the, all the warning and the cautioning comes. Because this is okay if you're already a devotee. But what about those who are genuinely bewildered and baffled by the negativity in the world and uh, they just can't even make it to the point of keeping their faith? or even developing any faith. This is another very large and ever-growing community. And many of them are very intelligent, educated people. And it's very hard to explain to them. And everything that see, they see around them is unfair, unjust. There is so much suffering inflicted on seemingly innocent people. You know, horrible, horrible crimes are being committed, uh, not even without even talking about the Ukraine crisis. For those people who are baffled, uh, again, he rewards them in a certain way, gives them what they want. They want disbelief. They want doubt. He, he rewards them. Always there is a small door open. At any stage, their mind changes, changes. They can come up that ladder. So the story, so, the best story of that is probably like uh, Ajmil, no? that story of Ajmila. Where uh, he's he's born as a Brahmin, and then uh, he de initially develops that uh, sort of uh, he's already in the path of devotion. He understands that that is the path, but then he goes, he like gets distracted, and he sees this prostitute, and then he mar like he marries her, has a son. He's very attached to son also, names him Nara, and and he does all kinds of um, like you know as they say like. Uh, you know, uh, tamasic uh, activities throughout his life or whatever. He does all, he engages in all that kind of stuff. Then at the end yeah. of his life, when he's about to die, that time the Yamadutas come to try to take him away. And then uh, big, uh, out of fear, he just says his son's name and now his son's name happens to be the name of the Lord. So then yeah. uh, the, the Vishnu Dutas come, then they have a debate with each other and say that, you know, look, even though he did all this, as soon as he said the name of the Lord, all his sins were absolved. And so, okay. one of the things, like, I think in that, you know, when the Yam, when Yamaraj is talking to the Yamadudha and telling them that, you know, that's correct. Like, you know, just because somebody did something bad throughout his life, you know, if he has even a little bit of change of heart, if he feels okay. that, you know, then we can't put him in, there's this, there's this like, a, like, there's this, like, insane chapter of the Bhagavatam, the final chapter of the fifth canto, right. where... They talk about the hellish planetary systems, and they mm. describe all the different like all the different like uh, uh, kinds of planets that you can get to if you perform certain kinds of sins and all stuff. When you listen to that, look, it sounds very scary because they describe and they're all, and they're de describing all kinds of horrible like uh, like treatments that you'll get. Like you know, well, don't want to get into it, but like yeah, there's a lot kinds of horrible treatments that are mentioned there. Now. So yeah, Yamara is saying that you know we shouldn't like we shouldn't do that. And so then upon hearing this conversation between both the sides, that means like he understands what he the mistakes that he made, like you know, that he was on the path and then he got deviated from the path, and then he came, then now he realized that he has this is the path, and then he goes back and then he attains that spiritual enlightenment and then he goes and then he reaches gets into whatever he, he reaches uh Vaikunta, whatever after some time. And uh, so, yeah, that's yeah, uh... very good example. And closer home uh, in the history of ISKCON, there's, uh, I'm sure there have been several such cases, but I am aware of 
major case where there was a black American, uh, very capable devotee in Srila Prabhupada's time, and he was given the spiritual name Sudama. Sudama as in Krishna's friend Sudama. So he was a, he gave up a lot of his youth, the years of his youth to please Srila Prabhupada and to open centers. And then because of his ability, he was sent to Japan to send, uh, to open a center. And it was very tough to make any kind of break in Japanese society basically is very closed and very unfriendly, extremely conservative. And those of them who had their faith in uh, Baudha or uh, in Buddhism, they were there, but even apart from that, it was very, very difficult. And Prabhupada used to tell these pioneers that our ISKCON centers are like embassies to the spiritual world. Whoever comes to a center should get a taste at least for the half an hour they spend in the center, seeing something very beautiful, eating free prasadam that is delicious, being given gifts, give, as, give, get a, like a preview or a sneak uh, preview. That's right of what it will be like if they make it in some lifetime back in the spiritual world. So he was very, he used to push his early disciples to just go no matter what price they paid to go and he, uh, start centers in way out places so that Africa, the Hawaii, I mean, the kind of hilly situations they faced in Africa. In, now in Japan, the Sudama was successful, but he paid a very heavy price for it. I think he was, no, it was Sudama who once came back when Prabhupada was alive and said, uh, uh, I don't know if it, is Sudha, if it was in Japan or in some other place that uh, I'm not getting any vegetarian, any vegetable food, so I'm eating meat. So, and, and then that person burst out and said, I knew this would happen, Prabhupada, when you send me there. So Prabhupada said, that's all right. We will make some arrangements for you. You won't go alone next time. He didn't slam the person and say, we went back to your meat eating, this most sinful of all activities. He didn't do that. Now, anyway, the Sudama uh, Prabhu was later given the Sanyas Danda to make his preaching more effective because once he made some kind of opening there, it became possible for people to submit to his, you know, to hear from him. And then this, the Sanyas Roads and the Sanyas Danda and the Sanyas Empowerment made his preaching even more effective. It went on like that. Srila Prabhupada passed away from this material plane in 1977. And around 10 years later, reports started coming in that the Sudama person, this devotee, was in big trouble. That uh, he had fallen into the clutches of the geishas. Geisha, you know, is this very sophisticated Japanese prostitute. She's trained as a little girl to grow up into that particular profession. It's not like the cheap brothel people who stand in red light areas in Mumbai. It's not like that, overpainted and looking like tarts. It's Geisha's, not like that. Yeah. It's a, it's a very. Oh uh, yeah, you you probably have heard. You know, uh, I mean, the, this the, term. The, the, there's a movie actually about it. Actually, that there's a movie, so I've seen that movie. So that's how I know the name. Okay, I mean, it's like uh, today, consider it all very unfair. They're supposed yeah. to wear some eye so that their feet never grow and remain very, very small and very attractive and so on and so on. So the geishas, I mean, if they, and then as someone else, when this news came in, my friend who's married to an American who's also was active in those parts in Prabhupada's time, he told me, he said, you have no idea how tough it is in places like Japan or like when you're a, a single man there, they, the women, they, they are so expert, they will somehow create circumstances to put you in their net. And he was isolated and he was not being able to come back to India. Or the sheer strain of having given up his youthful years, making such heavy sacrifices or the absence of Prabhupada, the changes that happened within his con, he felt maybe there was nobody who could turn to, who would not condemn him. Prabhupada didn't condemn him when he came back and said, I was supposed to eat meat. But that was not the case after Prabhupada passed away. There was a lot of immaturity and harsh treatment of devotees who went wrong. So whatever the reason that not only that he had fallen into the clutches of the geishas, a few years later, we heard that he was very seriously sick with some sexual diseases. His end came, he kind of rotted away. You know, some of these sexual diseases, if they start spreading, they uh, you rot away. like, like It's like almost like leprosy. But when devotees came to know, a husband and wife flew him to America 
and stayed with him, nursing him till he passed away. Because why there is this, there is this uh, compassion coming from? And we are talking about the compassion the Lord showed for Ajamil and arranged uh, in such a way that finally he was saved. When the Lord can't visit in front of us ordinary devotees, other people have to step in and show the same mood. And Prabhupada was also no longer there to show that mood. So this husband and wife who arranged for Sudama to leave Japan and to be back in America in some kind of hospice they put together and they're feeding him and nursing him and always with him for some two and a half years before he passed away. So there, uh, I think what why they were doing it is because they say they were present Yes, this is Sudama. He looks a little weird in his dressing. This is him. Mm -hmm. There is the memo series which uh, Siddhanta Prabhu has done. You, you should hear him here. He dresses almost, I don't know, some gypsy, gypsy clothes. He's there. This is, I think, in his better days. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So they say they were there uh, when Srila Prabhupada, when uh, Sudama was sent and Srila Prabhupada made a kind of promise to Sudama that if you succeed in opening a center in Japan, I will personally take you back to come and take you back to Godhead. You know, meaning at the time of death. So somehow they felt Sudama had made such huge sacrifices. And if the organization as a whole could not do much for him because they were busy with their own struggles, this couple raised the funds. I'm sure they advertised and raised the funds from other devotees. They were not that well of themselves, but they were with him till the end. Now in Japan, I know for a fact that there is an there are ISKCON centers, and there is even ISKCON guest houses. Because in the royal family there in Travancore, the second Maharani, the second one, the one who writes books, not the elder one, the second one is Ashwati Tirunal. Your father will know. She is very much into writing and authoring and uh, uh, historical tradition and devotional tradition in Kerala. So she told me. I don't know much about your ISKCON, but they were a great help when I went to Japan because I stayed as a life member of ISKCON, I stayed in their guest house. This meant I could get clean vegetarian food. I was safe as a woman this many years ago. Now she's about Amma's age. You know, so whatever seed was put there, whatever huge sacrifices were made, it's going to help other people maintain their faith when they travel abroad or increase their faith. So it's this uh, point what you said about that mercy that uh, Krishna rewards them accordingly. Somewhere Rajamila showed very genuine faith and then went off track. But uh, some arrangement is made for him to be claimed back and to get back to the right destination. So here what's being said is and those who are impersonalists and who want to commit spiritual suicide by annihilating the individual existence now, which line is that in this purport in 4.11? Let me see. This one, no? As for those who are impersonal and who want to commit spiritual suicide by enlightening the individual existence of the Krishna helps yeah. also by absorbing them into his effulgence. Right. This is a very severe criticism of impersonalists. Many, many spiritual religious organizations that are very popular today have nothing more to offer than an impersonal conception of God. They may call him by some different names. They don't have anything more to offer. And then they, apart from an impersonal conception of God. So you will see the Brahma Kumaris will say God is light. They are also very popular. And uh, uh, I cannot speak by name for some of the others. But I think it's very much along the same lines. They, it's a, it, it goes on to say, such impersonalists do not agree to accept the eternal blissful personality of God and therefore they cannot relish the bliss of transcendental personal service to the Lord, having extinguished their individuality. This extinguishing their individuality is a natural outcome of so much of suffering and grief and pain that we undergo. We don't want to be individuals or persons who have personal relationships with other members because we already suffered, we got cheated, we got taken for a ride, we, something happened to us, it was very unfair. So the tendency in modern society is to downplay the individualism and the personalism. So these people are very attracted to impersonalist organizations that give an impersonal conception of God. And those heading those organizations, why they are fearful of the personal details of the Lord. He likes this food. He likes to dress like this. He did this past time. He said this in this Leela. Why are they scared? Normally those leaders don't want to see the personal side because they are so envious. 
they have so much envy for the enjoyment that the lord is knowing because otherwise what is the big deal in understanding that every god need not be krishna say it is ganesh he likes modakams you know what what is so difficult in understand this point that he basically likes modakams everyone has someone likes one type of sweet or snack and someone doesn't like it so basically for him for uh, ganapati it is modakams here it is often if you see the ganesh temple here in pavangadi the prasadam that's given after offering to the deity there it's usually uh, uniyappam or else it is that uh, sugiyan which is the closest you come to the modakam some other deity like something else uh, with shiva it is always i am not remembering very clearly but there's something else that the deity somehow the stala puran that means wherever the deity manifests the particular idol manifested will have a certain historical records of things that happened or by word of mouth and then please narrate what are the likes and dislikes of that particular deity so with krishna of course everyone knows butter thief and so on with uh, uh, i can't think of meaning like so many immediately uh, so similarly with hanuman it's always the vettala leaf that is put on him as a garland i'm not sure why the pan ka leaf and butter of course and um, was, i don't know if we were speaking sure hanuman no there's this uh, sorry to like uh, go off track a little bit but uh, there's yeah. a story of uh, hanuman i don't know if it's true but i was reading it somewhere where he meets krishna at some point yeah. in uh, but i'm not sure like uh, like um, see like as in like he's 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 supposed to be those uh, what is that um, mm, that um, you know those people who are immortal no like or something like that i think uh, chiranjeevi Chiran yeah he's i yeah. think one of the chiranjeevis and uh, also he's like uh, um, like as long as there's ram in this uh, in this like uh, existence hanuman also be, will also be there so there's this one story i read somewhere in google i, I was just trying to figure out is there ever was there ever a uh, was there ever a point in time when hanuman had met krishna also you know because if he's a chiranjeevi he would have definitely met krishna because he his thing was before krishna, uh, before krishna right so he would have definitely met krishna at some point so i was like, trying to figure out and i was like, couldn't find anything properly then finally somewhere i found this thing where it said like he like i think once like um, something happened like i think Na narad was with krishna at one at one one point and uh, i think narad found out where hanuman was and he found out hanuman was in some mountain or somewhere like very close to where krishna was itself it was in a mountain also i'm sure even krishna also must have knew knew is known that hanuman was there also but like the thing is like, i think uh, hanuman's thing was that there was this i think when uh, when ram died he had there was this thing some somebody gave told him that you have to be in this world uh, like you know um you have to stay alive or you have to be here till ram comes back and gives you and gives you a mission to do so uh, so i'm yeah. not sure like uh, have you read, have you heard about this this story like, that it is hanuman's job or hanuman's instruction that is received that he has to be here yeah. until some second bit but a direct meeting with krishna i'm not sure i mean i can check whether this is authentic or not anyway mm. ju just uh, mm. when the mahabharat about to be in the start of the book then the first chapter hanuman is present on the flag of arjuna's chariot it's mm. not just a emblem or a embroidery piece like the way if we put a photo or you know we embroider on a flag he is supposed to be physically present to throw in his might on arjuna's side uh, because this is part of the signs of victory for arjuna and before he collapses into lamentation and dismay and grief and delusion and all that one of them is there is a krishna himself is there as a charity the flag is flying and the flag basically has a, a, a hanuman on it in some form and uh, so hanuman is it's understood to be present there and this itself is a clear sign because of hanuman's great might and being very 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 strong that they will be that much i can guarantee but what you're saying mm. i have to check up mm. and remember that i know the other instance where hanuman a uh, shani bhagwan is trying to cross and hanuman's tail is lying on the way perhaps you know ah yeah that that's what i know yeah yeah 
those who are frightened of shani rather than appeasing shani in their, because they have some shani dasha or dosha or whatever they are advised to please hanuman by doing some offerings because mm. if hanuman please and shani won't mess with them this is this is the general kind of idea so uh, to get back to what we are saying the impersonalism mm. so it is a very strong statement against impersonalism much of what you uh, maybe we can't go into this today name names but most of the organization they don't another reason how uh, impersonalism works is impersonalism and mayavadi which basically are interchangeably in prabhupada's writings the impersonalists don't want to see a personal form of the lord and the mayavadis they go one step further they accept the personal form of the lord but they conclude very wrongly and mischievously that the lord has taken a personal form and that is basically made of matter that it is maya it is all maya so the mischief in this is they can also do the reverse and become krishna temporarily this is the mischief one are the hardcore impersonalists who refuse to accept the personal form of the lord they don't engage in deity worship they will talk only about light light the lord is light and so on and uh, or the lord is just a presence uh, they will not accept that the vigraha is yes made out of stone by shilapatis but if the lord decides he can actually speak to the devotee internally at least who is standing and praying desperately in front of the vigraha they don't accept that at all those are the impersonalists what do they want they want to just merge with the brahman or the brahma jyoti that is the blazing effulgence around the lord and the lord grants that also okay that's what they want let them go and merge so it is like spiritual annihilation because if you lose your individuality and you just merge you can't have any interaction with the supreme lord imagine being so close to the supreme lord but not having the facility to interact or talk or to do or to serve or so this is they are willfully saying that's the kind of relationship they want uh, uh, but the mayavadis which is another term is go one step further they don't deny the personal form of the lord but they say yes lord is like this blue in color if it's lord shiva he has these locks whatever but this is the supreme lord particularly that it is all maya mithya it is made of matter his form and he has uh, when he comes down to earth he becomes just an ordinary human being actually it's not true he may play like an ordinary human being to attract us humans but he never becomes an ordinary human being so it's his form is all just matter and then they turn that logic the other way around and say therefore if we are um uh, sufficiently advanced meaning some of them they can become god this is the real mischief therefore you will see mayavadi sadhus when they meet each other they will say narayana narayana they are not referring to narayana as in vishnu they are referring to each other as being narayana narayana oh okay so it's a very dangerous and uh, kind of mischievous uh, um, very dominant tendency especially amongst hindu organizations in india so it leads occasionally to lot of fakery manipulation exploitation of sincere devotees because this leader can start playing god because he thinks when the lord came down in different forms as ram krishna narsimha yeah he had a personal form he had a particular appearance ram looks different from krishna nobody who knows will mistake but that is all made it is all maya it is fully a material form and therefore if i become sufficiently advanced by the reverse logic i can become someone can become the lord himself then after a while things i mean they can start really taking devotees for a ride so mayavad and spiritual uh, uh, annihilation committing spiritual suicide it's he is very heavy in his purport of commentary uh, and then he goes on in the following um, sentence some of them who are not firmly situated even in the impersonal existence return to this material field to exhibit their dormant desire for activity this uh, is like they get bored there they get lonely there so when their pious credit runs out they fall back in the material planet they are given a chance to act on the material planet then there's another warning that's given here that there are people who do ashtanga yoga not what we see today though mind you some of it is very useful 
I am now watching uh, Baba Ramdev's uh, uh, basic yoga for beginners and doing things, just starting with that and doing things for excess weight, for uh, digestive problems. And I find all of it very useful and very clear. But here they are talking about people who take to Ashtanga Yoga or Hatha Yoga, as it's called, or even Dhyana Yoga, uh, as a way, as a path for ultimate spiritual realization. Mm. So even for, them, even for them, as he is warning, at some point, the Lord in the heart knows that that practitioner doesn't really want the Lord. This is the interesting thing. What does the practitioner or yogi want? He wants those mystic powers which are available as byproducts. They are called I think the Ashta Siddhis. You know, you can become lighter than a feather, you can become heavier than a stone, you can reach, put your hand out and pluck something from another planet, you can influence somebody to act in a way that you want, or whatever you want, you can you desire, you can catch and get, you can become smaller than an atom, you can become bigger than these things are real, these mystic siddhis. Some of them some of these things might be visible, one or two of these kind of cities, some uh, spiritual leaders might be able to exhibit. But Narada, uh, Narada was called a transcendental spaceman, uh, Narada Muni, because he could just take his veena and fly through space and go to different palaces and often form in trouble to help the Lord in his grand plan. That uh, the but, story of the that is interesting. I learned, I kind of understood like why that happened. Like he was cursed by Daksha in, uh, yeah, yeah. in that creation story when Daksha creates like a thousand uh, like um, sons or whatever. And uh, Narad goes and convinces them first that you know that why are you wasting your time doing this creation and all that. Go and uh, devote yourself to Supreme Lord. So they all go. Then again, then so Daksha is very like upset and sad. So then he goes to Brahma. And Brahma tells him, like, don't worry, you make another thousand uh, sons and then they will be responsible for the creation. So then they again, but they again go to Narada again and then Narada tell, convinces them to say. So in this whole thing, like Daksha becomes very angry at uh, uh, Narada. And then he curses him and says that you will never be, uh, you will never be in one place. You'll always keep moving around everywhere else. So, that's so in, in that way, like he keeps move, moving around all the time. Like he'll never, like he is like uh, what he is doing. He will not be in one place only. He will do what he's doing in various other places. Like he'll keep going everywhere, and he'll do that. So, so it is. It is really like he's the embodiment of that mystic city to be able to travel. It's. Uh, I mean, he's called the transcendental spaceman. He doesn't need hmm. space suits and so anything. But similarly, yogis. Prabhupada writes somewhere else, I don't know in which purport, or maybe in a lecture, that there were yogis and there still are yogis in the Himalayas who can simultaneously take a bath in the Ganges in Haridwar, uh, in the sea in Rameshwaram, in the ocean, in Bay of Bengal, somewhere, you know, they can simultaneously, someone may say, why I saw that particular so-and-so Swami, he was here today, and someone else by phone may say, no, but I saw him, I talked to him, he was here in Haridwar. So these are real siddhis, but what the, but they are considered a trap on the path of Dhyana Yoga or what's also called Ashtanga Yoga, Hatha Yoga, mm -hmm. because they are so attractive. This uh, the power of the mystic siddhis. They are so um, enjoyable and attractive, and they bring power. So some of these yogis, just with the byproducts and just tasting the power that comes from it, and they lose sight of their original goal, which was to realize the Supreme Lord. So if that's what they want, it says here that then that's also given to them. So it's really that according to what you desire, if you really desire something much more, uh, uh, rest assured that some or the other, the Lord will arrange for you to qualify yourself and come and get whatever it is you want. And hopefully if it is something spiritual, then that's best rather than material, which is so temporary and uncertain. So this was a crucial verse, the 11th verse. And one remaining other crucial verse, not so much to discuss, but it's a real beacon of light, which is four point, it throws so much light uh, uh, on how to make progress in spiritual life. That is the 31st verse of the same chapter. Mm. 
Yeah, it's a question. Very, yeah, it's a simple rhetorical kind of question. Without sacrifice, what can one achieve? One can live happily on this planet or in this life and what kind of the next? So sacrifice, it's, it's just a very good question. And uh, uh, the foundation of this, why he's asking such a question is, and what we should understand is basically the material world is a very unsure, uncertain place to be in. You have to make adjustments. Everybody is always making adjustments. Even the happiest family and the happiest mother and son or the happiest husband and wife, you wait a little and ask them, they are also making some adjustment because there is no other way to live in this material world. We are not meant to eternally be happily situated here. It's temporary and it is constantly like changing the situations. So the only way is to adjust. And what do we mean by adjust? We sacrifice, we tolerate. So therefore, sacrifices and sacrificing food by fasting, sacrificing our sleep by rising early, sacrificing our comfort sometimes in some way, sacrificing our wealth by giving away what we can do without and even more than what we can do without. These are very healthy practices because they develop in us this antidote for getting stuck with attachment to situations. One is that they prepare us very nicely to survive in this world. It's not working out, okay, accept it. Sacrifice your whole wish that something would have worked out. Somebody else is not behaving or reciprocating the way you really thought he or she would. Accept it. Sacrifice your whole aspiration or expectation. And then life becomes much easier. Because like this is the world is, this material world is such a difficult place basically that the only way to survive here is to keep adjusting. And those who are better at adjusting go a much further way. But One those who are I... very... Yeah, uh, sorry to cut you off. Actually, one thing that I uh, like noticed in Krishna consciousness, like you know, at least in the path of devotion, is that you need to have like uh, you need to have a lot of uh, like faith in Krishna that He will help you in all the issues and difficulties that you have in life, and you can't like uh, you can't play the victim card most of the time. You can't. Uh, so you can't say that, you know, oh, I was, uh, I had this problem and, you know, I, you know, I had to, you know, I'm, I'm suffering through this. I'm doing this. All this is happening to me. You can't say all that because if you say that, then, uh, you know, like uh, you're, you're not on the path of devotion, essentially, like, you know, and uh, you have to like, uh, you have to say that the suffering is also like part of, you know, like Krishna itself is energy or whatever you want to call it. So. And you know this will this will go this will pass you know it will just be like a small phase it will pass after some time. So that thing is like you know I think that's one thing that I've like uh, really realized like in Krishna consciousness like especially you can't uh, you can't uh, you know uh, you like every, everything almost is like a sacrifice you do it for Krishna to some level to for the right. bet betterment of your own uh, this thing and it's it's quite tough for people to like. Uh, people who don't have any idea of uh, Krishna or you know have no idea on the path of bhakti and all that for them like if you ask them to sacrifice they'll be like what well like you know what what do you want me to do like you know I'm already engaged in this what more do you want me to do so it's like I mean a lot of people who will say like I have different versions of I have different versions of God I have like I believe that God is like you know I believe in a lot of gods or like I believe in like the idea of like you know going and worshipping one one particular god for one particular uh, issue that I have like some gods are like meant for material wealth and some gods are meant for some other purpose right so but the idea that all of them are in service also to Krishna in the end ultimately let's say in this particular right. path that idea right is not very is very difficult for some people to understand that like i've noticed it's not easy because like if you try to explain it also people will be like no i don't understand because it's i think something you have to get inside i don't know what it is but you have to understand it like inside but it's not easy okay. like if you try to explain like they will say no but like krishna's krishna is a god his job is to maintain the world that's the fundamental idea that people think his job is to maintain the world 
and shiva's job is let's say to destroy the world brahma's job is to create the world and like then you've got gods that have different purposes like lakshmi has is the goddess of wealth but like it's all like but that idea of it all being in relation to krishna is not something that is that people can wrap their head around so i just i think yeah. it's one is if somebody is intelligent uh, in any situation they will always look for a, the larger picture but most people are not very intelligent they get tied up with just their short term vision and their narrow vision of what they see in front of them what they've been trained to see a naturally curious having intelligent mind will start asking for more details supposing say you will see the school most children are like i'm i'm presuming like at least middle school you are when decide you have to change school you have to school very good training and they're desperately trying to get it now the child is happy he's introduced to the principal he's got to get a certain mark in the entrance exam he is shown what the building is like but um, naturally this and more intelligent person will ask more questions how many years ago was the school made and who are the famous people who got out of the school alumni or uh, you know how many uh, so on whatever so like that i feel even with the gods that they that or uh, the average person is trained to worship and put their faith in to make the connections it requires another level of intelligence to make to connect to make the connections now actually if someone were to explain that krishna is supreme yeah he comes in one incarnation as mahavishnu whose job it is to maintain that we will come to the incarnations there are numerous incarnations but krishna as we know him as krishna his main job is to get each one of us back out of the cycle now it's not a easy part so he station different people different of his own uh, sub parts that are the demigods some are meant to supply and keep us happy i think sir lakshmi if she is pleased keeps giving the fortune that's required for a family to move forward and someone else produces something else and so on but that they are working all in tandem and in unison is taking too much for an average mind to digest but you are yeah. lucky you all did the hang of this and even more difficult to explain to devi bhaktas really difficult hmm. is that devi or durga as a name suggests which is a fort fortress hmm. Hmm. Durga, or that Durga or Devi or Maya or whatever name or Parvati, the consort, their job is basically uh, to keep you inside this prison and keep you happy. Because if hmm. that's all that you want, them to give you that. Therefore, you will see generally, especially the lady of the house is encouraged to have faith in some Devi worship. Normally, there's a Kudumba Devi Shetram. We've also been told that they have their place. you keep that devi happy and then automatically the family stays on track these are very major challenges that you know people raising in family life face but to, if you explain to them that their job is actually her job is to keep you in this prison and the minute you want to enquire for something more then krishna instructs her make way let this person come to me i think this is all very difficult actually it's a very efficient system he set up but it's very and that sometimes this jiva takes many lifetimes for all this to happen and by devi worship i don't mean just a woman automatically it may even be men or you know the female form is there to supply and to be frightened of and to please and appease but that she has a much higher role as a imprisoner to keep us happy in this material world with all our successes and uh, getting all our wants fulfilled and to keep us happy with a whip inside a golden cage but the minute you feel this is not enough there must be something higher the signal goes to krishna and he basically instructs sir open uh suppose so you are muted uh thank you camera also not okay yeah, i think sorry. you're back yeah yeah that's fine so i think these are very hard concepts but that's why again the knowledge of the incarnations that's given as given like story form and otherwise is given briefly here in the ninth verse purport we have to have us take a small look at that okay the ninth verse 
uh, of this if you just move because the incarnations it's if we understand that clearly then we understand the bigger picture the ninth verse of the fourth chapter uh, one who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not upon leaving the body take his birth again in this material world but attains oh, my but eternal abode actually it is in the sorry it my mistake is in the purport before that verse is in the eighth verse oh. purport okay to to deliver the pious and to annihilate the miscreants as well as to reestablish the principles of religion i myself yeah. appear millennium after millennium yeah you skip all that because uh, uh, it's basically giving a lot of information about how the word avatar comes an avatar is just a lord who descends in some form avatar means to come down uh, but and to go to the second last paragraph there are various kind of avatars the opening sentence of the second last paragraph is there are various kinds of avatars did you find it of uh, the second last paragraph yeah second last para of the purport of the at uh, eighth verse that's right of the eighth verse okay. okay just give me a minute i think i'm just trying to open this uh yeah second last paragraph this one right there are various kinds of avatars such as purusha yeah. avatar guna avatar uh, leela avatars sakya vesh avatars manvantara okay. avatars and yuga avatars just very briefly because if even one of them the first the purush avatar is explained clearly it will answer your point that most people have this idea vishnu is there to maintain krishna to, uh, sorry and uh, shiva to destroy and brahma to create and that's the end of the matter actually that vishnu what they have are talking about is is one of the purush avatars is mahavishnu that's very different from vishnu as in the krishna vishnu here the purush avatar means it's all just different stages of creation so as a purush avatar when krishna comes down as one of the purush avatars initially he is uh, one form of vishnu uh, mahavishnu that just glances at material nature and activates and makes things happen in the next stage he enters into each of the universes and lies down there and fills some parts of the universe with water and so on and from his navel a lotus appears and on that lotus is seated brahma so he is called the garbhodaka shai vishnu because from his garbha or navel or stomach something happens a lot brahma is coming out on a lotus after having done that much he then gets into again further into each of these universes and enters into each person as the super soul and that is a third vishnu so these three forms of vishnu are the purush avatars the average person only knows this much this vishnu that he is there to maintain maintain individually and he doesn't know about the vishnu as in the krishna of the leelas and so on to, who's come to attract us you know to kill hiranyakashipu as narasimha to kill ravana as he doesn't know all that at all so these are the purush avatars just briefly without making it too confusing guna avatar means this is again very interesting you know of the three gunas right the mode of goodness uh, mode of goodness passion ignorance that uh, other word sattva guna um uh, tamaguna uh, and tamaguna rajaguna rajaguna that's right so the guna avatar means for the purpose of fulfilling the grand plan of krishna uh lord shiva becomes a representative of tamoguna that is not to say that lord shiva is in ignorance that would be sacrilege is not like that he is mastered ignorance basically he uh. is to act he do his tandava nritya and destroy because the tendency to destroy is really coming from tamoguna you see sometimes in children you just give them a toy and they take it apart not out of curiosity to understand that is a higher kind of consciousness some children show they want to know how the little jeep works they take it apart that's a kind of engineering streak in them but generally you say anja minute kurta madhi adinanga potichu you know in malayalam that that even a female child anang illade aaku this is really coming from tamas and the war that you see now so much destruction forget about just even the streets of ukraine being littered with bodies and so on to repair all this damage and make it habitable in my generation i have never come across a situation like this 
how much it's going to take, even if the whole world pulls in and floods Ukraine with money, the effort to rebuild and to reset up. So this is tamas. It does such a destruction. You now, when we eat and drink stuff that doesn't suit us, we are acting in tamaguna. See, I have acidity, hyper acidity, but I am very careless. I still like to drink the occasional strong tea or strong coffee, or I drink fizzy drinks. I know it is making me worse. I can feel heartburn immediately, but I can't resist it. I'm acting in Tamaguna. It is destructive to my own interests. So uh, Lord Shiva basically plays that role as the master of Tamaguna, which is not to say he is in Tamaguna. So that is an avatar. And who is taking that? Basically, they are saying, the Lord himself, Lord Krishna himself, empowers Shiva to play that role as a guna avatar. Similarly, the Lord empowers Brahma to play uh, the role, take the role of a guna avatar and create after the Lord fills him with no, full knowledge in the heart of what to do and how to do it. And so also with Vishnu as maintainer, that is the original Krishna who fills that form of Vishnu as uh, with Sattva guna so that he can maintain. It actually, if you see even in organization, sometimes a very dynamic person, it takes a very dynamic Rajoguna person to create something new. Then different things happen. He gets sacked or he gets upset and he leaves. And then a more sorted person by the arrangement of the Lord enters that same organization just to maintain what the first person has created. So if we were to understand all this, we see these patterns happening even in our lives. And we can save ourselves a lot of misery and uh, blame game and guilt and unhappiness. I mean, I've seen this. I, someone is there, someone sets up something. Say, we are the people who created, set up a whole course. It's happening actually even to me and my colleagues. We struggled to set up the ladies' bhakti shastri. That was the task we were given. And for 15 years, we were teaching regularly, taking all the difficult times that come with the fledgling course, etc. Now, we have grown older. We have our health issues. We have our domestic responsibilities. We can't always go back to Mayapur and, of course, online course. But a fresh batch has come of teachers who just have to maintain. We already set up the syllabus, how the exams work you know, how many essays, that's all been thrashed out. So if we were to just crib and cry and say nobody has any value for us and now look, they all have it very easy. They just have to take the things we created. That's stupid because this is a pattern. You know, first someone in Rajoguna creates, then come maybe more sattvic people by the Lord's arrangement who just have to maintain and they are not, they are also active, but they are thoughtfully active. They don't have to rush around like us you know, from when there was no campus, we were operating out of rented rooms. We lived somewhere else. The lunch was in a third place. It was all typical Rajasik frenzy, the sign of the times when we taught for 15 years. Now the Mayapur Institute has a so many acre campus. It's, you know, every, everything is just under one roof. The classes are there, the students and teachers live there, and the food the arrangements, the prasadam is there. So much more sadly. And then, God forbid, but time may come when this has to make way for some other plan and then uh, some tamasic character will come and destroy everything. So this is a cycle. If we understand these Purush avatars and the Guna avatars and we can apply in our own lives, it's very useful handy tip to have when we are eased out or shoved out of situations. It's also helpful for aging parents who no longer get respect Grandparents, I would say, their word doesn't count as much as it should because uh, times are changing. People say, oh, grandpa, I mean, that's all very well, but I can't keep my job if I do what you're asking me to do. See, this, this, in this way, the scriptures are very great buffer for us to take the blows that any way life is going to give us. So that's the Guna Avatar. Then the Leela Avatar doesn't need any, any explanation. So many Leelas. That is, he comes as Ram, he past comes time. as Ram. Past times. He comes as Kurma, he comes as Vara, etc. And then the Shakti Avesh Avatar, Manamantra Yuga Avatar. Shakti Avesh Avatar basically empowered portions of the Lord that come and do something fantastic and uh, they are partially empowered so Jesus is accepted actually as a Shakti Avesh avatar. 
Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, the Christians see him as the son of God. That's different. But as that he was so empowered, he could do miracles, he could show a new way, he left his teachings and so on. I'm just giving one example. There can be many other Shakti Abhish avatars. Manavantara avatars, it's a little complicated. Each age of Manu, I can't explain so clearly. Yuga avatar, each Yuga has an avatar and just to stick to our Yuga, which is the Kali Yuga, yet to come is the Kalki avatar. Now, apart many, many years later and the Bhagavatam talks in the 12th canto, how you will come on a white horse and how you will be born in a particular family in Bihar and so on. And he will have a sword and etc. Leave all that. Apart from all these avatars, there are still many, many other avatars. What does it show? That the Lord is so eager to send help again and again and again. It's like you ask some people for some help. They give you the help, then they keep, almost they become like pestilential, like pests. They keep calling again and again and saying, okay, but did you, did it work out? Shall I speak again to that person? Did you get this? Did you get that? Now, uh, this is on the material platform, but for the Lord out of his enormous sympathy and kindness to make the jivas, give them every chance and opportunity to hear about him, get attracted to him and to get out, he still sends other under the table kind of avatars. And one of them is the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu avatar who is called a Channa avatar. There are Puranas that speak of it. Channa meaning basically covered, concealed. That uh, it is in the very difficult Kali Yuga, just 500 years ago, he comes, he takes birth in a, in a Brahmin family, does many miracles and pastimes and leaves this secret that it's not so difficult to get spiritually realized. You, it's a very easy way, whatever your caste may be, whatever your habits may be, to clean the heart, just chant the Mahamantra for this age. And if you're a Christian, chant whatever it is you've been taught to chant. So also with Islam. Just chanting of the holy name of the Lord cleanses the heart and saves and protects us and gets us back. So he came in a very concealed form. The Channavatan. Many people don't know. The textbooks describe him as a social reformer because he preached to the Muslims and he tried to argue and convince them and he took followers from other religions. So he is considered a social reformer. But basically, he did miracles that establish his position as the Lord himself. If you go to those pastime places, now, whether it is in Puri or in Mayapur, actually, the day he, in, he came or was born or appeared is coming next week. The anniversary is coming. That's what's called Gaura Purnima or Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's. Mm. I told you next Friday, but from Thursday, we start massive cooking and preparations at home and in the temple, change the deity dresses and so on. So these avatars, these are given here. And uh, just even briefly, if we were to look at one striking pastime, I think you are yet to come to it, which is because you have not yet come to the eighth canto. Isn't that right? You have yet to come yeah, to yeah. the eighth canto. I'm in the sixth canto, 16th chapter. Okay, that's good. So what are you reading of now in the 16th chapter? So right now, I think we had, I had finished the story of Chitra Ketu, uh, okay. where he like he has this ba like baby who's like I mean, he has um angira and all that uh gives him this thing right like he's uh given this ability yeah. to you know he has a baby he's lamenting that he doesn't have a baby angira tells him like you know i'll give you a baby uh you'll get a baby but then this baby will be the source of your jubilation and lamentation yeah and then as soon as the baby is born like he's very much att attached to the child and uh, then the also the uh, um, this uh, yeah, but also the same. And also he's attached to the wife of the child, the co the wife, the one of the queens who's like he's got many queens, right? So the queen right. that delivered this child, it was it came. Uh, uh, Angela gave uh, gave them like a rice something, sweet rice something, and they had to have that. They have the wives if she had it, then she would deliver. Yeah. And yeah. so, like like that, the child is born, and so he became attached to the child and the wife so much that he forgot about his co-wives, and his co-wives mm -hmm. ended up poisoning the child, the baby. So the baby died, and so then there was a massive like there was a big lamentation after that, and so then right. uh, uh, then Nara then Angira come and then they try to explain, uh, they basically trying to explain like you know what he's supposed to do, like you know there's no point in lam lament lamenting and all right. actually i have i'm like i make notes and all that stuff so like oh, very uh, nice <laughs> very 
I mean, hmm. so like I made Same. these notes. So like I mean, these are all different notes that I had made. But hmm. like, so like right now, uh, so like yesterday, like when I was reading the fifteen chapter, there was this like one. Um, there was this one this thing like you know when they were talking about death, and I thought this 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 this, this verse in that uh, is the can six canto chapter fifteen text three. So okay. in that uh, like Angira is telling uh, this uh, Chitraketu that mm-hmm. okay, a small part is talking about death and why he shouldn't lie. I'm like you know he's like were, were you the same person when you got this child now? Or were I you uh, when you or, and were you the same person when you got the cell before you got it or were you, are you the same? You were you were like were you different or you know? So he tells him that it doesn't matter like whether this child is dead or not. And so he gives this thing says, "O king, as a sm- small particles of sand sometimes come together and are sometimes separated due, separated due to the force of the waves. The living entities yeah. who have accepted the material bodies come together and are sometimes separated by the force of time." So mm-hmm. I thought that is like it. Uh, it's a very uh, I thought that was pretty powerful. Like in terms when you're talking about death. Yeah, you like the simile or the analogy, you know, like of yeah. sands coming and parting. Yeah. Yeah. So like sometimes you like sometimes those sands separated due to the force of the waves. The living entities also have accepted the material bodies, and they sometimes come together, but they're also separated Correct. by the force of time. So just like Absolutely. the sand. So it's like, why do you lament over death? Then there is no point in lamenting over death in that case. So, I thought that whether was pretty. Like, yeah, very good. Because whether we like it or not, it's a bitter truth. And grief is real. When we lose somebody, we like it's genuine grief. You can't not go through it. I mean, this is not human. I mean, the grief comes and you go through it. But this, these realizations tell us that we have to accept this bitter truth that. It is like passengers who get on a train and you become very friendly and close maybe over two, three days, but each one gets off at his destination, which is at a different time. The station comes at a different time. It's a little like that. So which all, all it means is that then if you know this, to try not to be, put too much attachment and affection into people who anyway are going to go. So uh, this uh, Bhagavatam is real. It's not mythology. It is not something that was meant for another age. It continues to help us. And a brief look at the churning the milk ocean, you see how many times the Lord appears to uh, set things right for the devatas and to set that when he's saying here in the fourth chapter that he comes again and again, you know, here we saw the, the mm-hmm. seven, the eight verses we saw. Why does he come? And then he comes, Paritrana Sadhu Nam to save, to deliver the pious and Yada Yada Hi Dharmasya. That is, when does he come? How often does he come? Every time the religion becomes like too much. So, why does he come? To reestablish the principles of religion. This 4.7, 4.8, these verses. Uh, in, these, in this particular pastime, churning the milk ocean, where the devatas and the demons got into a situation of fighting where some of the devatas were being overpowered by the demons. So uh, they go via, they petition the Lord, that is Mahavishnu lying in the Milky Ocean. Uh, uh, they petition through Brahma, who is the chief of the demigods, and he's got a very supreme position. So they petition, and surprisingly, normally the Lord would basically come down and say, I will just finish off the, uh, the wrongdoers. But here he doesn't do it. He drags out the whole solution. Like, you know, now they talk about a humanitarian corridor for some hours and they say make peace, truce. In a similar way, in the Ukraine crisis, in a similar way, because they never keep their word. But here the Lord advises the devatas to go and make peace or truce with the demons and then tells him during the period of truce that they, they have to churn, the milky o- churn this ocean using the Mandara mountain. And uh, what will happen when the Mandara mountain, which has some herbs in it, is churned? different jewels and gems will come out and basically they will get Amrit or the nectar, which uh, who, whichever party gets it will then be all powerful and be able to defeat the other. This is the whole logic. But at each step, you have to really read this. This is chapter 8 canto, starting from chapter 5, 6, 7, 7 and 8 are crucial. It goes on like that in almost chapter 12. So this in this uh, first, of course, when they try, when the devatas are told, go and bring the Mandara mountain and start the journey. 
uh, to get the amrit and then the demons on the other side you need two parts to pull to turn so when they go and get the mandara mountain the mandara mountain is so heavy that it is crushing them so the lord then goes on his garud uh, vahana takes the mandara mountain puts it on garud and then carries the mandara to the so the milky ocean which has to be churned then they need something to churn it with so they get vasuki that, that serpent the vasuki the serpent is brought to churn but vasuki won't stay quiet in a place where garuda a natural enemy because eagles like garuda likes to eat snakes garuda is a non vegetarian personality in all these scriptures just keep that in mind he is not vegetarian so he so garuda is sent away and then there is just uh, the vasuki the snake that is used as a rope to churn there are the devatas on one side and the others then of course when vasuki the snake is being churned the, from the middle of his stomach which is agitated so much poisonous fumes come out of his mouth and the devatas start to die so now the problem is what to do they thought it will all be very easy peace is simple so then amongst the demi gods lord shiva having a very unique position comes forward and he says he will take the poison and it's okay and he won't be harmed and nobody will be harmed in his usual magnanimous character nature so he holds it in his uh, uh, oh yeah. that's that's why he has that uh, blue neck mm -hmm. here and all that 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 thing that's yeah. funny. like nilakanteshwar temple nilakanteshwar mahadev sri kanteshwar uh, etc so he that part is taken care of then they continue churning like this on both sides and so many things come out the kausuba jewel comes the airavat elephant comes out the horse comes out the surubi cow comes out finally lakshmi devi comes out of the churn all these kind of great things coming out until amrit is produced lakshmi devi then walks away after selecting vishnu from the audience as the only worthy suitor for herself she goes off then comes dhanavantari this glowing form this is another incarnation of the lord just see oh even before all this when the mandara mountain was constantly slipping and sliding the lord comes as the kurma avatar to allow the mandara to be put on his hard shell rock so that it wouldn't slip and topple each while they were doing the uh, so he appears there again to give help then he comes as the, the finally as the dhanavantri holding this great jeweled pot of nectar immediately the demons being very untrustworthy and very cunning people they just go and fight and drag take that urn of pot of amrit because they want to be chiranjeevi eternal if they drink amrit they are never going to die in hell so they take that and they run off with it now the thing about this kind of demonic people is that they will start fighting amongst themselves so that also starts happening then appears the, the, the devatas are obviously completely heartbroken that the whole purpose is lost now they have got hold of the amrit So then comes the Lord again in the form of the Mohini Murti, a dazzlingly beautiful woman, who brings peace and calm and quiet. And the demons are also so captivated that uh, they uh, promptly hand back the urn. And she says, "Be calm. I know you can trust me, and I will give everyone their share. Let me deal with the devatas." What she's doing is she's planning to trick and fool the demons and give everything away to the devatas and then vanish, so that there's nothing for the demons to drink. in the situation rao and ketu being more cunning than the rest understand what's going on they disguise themselves and stand in the queue or line of the devatas to drink it and uh, vishnu himself who's watching understands and cuts off their head so that is why they are headless planets and uh, considered basically great trouble makers after this is after the mohini murti avatar finally gives what is given to the devatas and the demons are defeated because now the devatas have all the power and so on there is one final lesson that the lord wants to teach which is the bewilderment of lord shiva by the mohini murti lord shiva is watching all these proceedings is so fascinated with the beauty of the lady that he hunts her out and goes so the lord is constantly ready to teach if we are willing to learn he is so patient it's just that that when we are in the lower mode we can't see his hand in things we are our mind is so noisy constantly dictating a dialogue or a monologue once we have turned our face towards the lord he makes umpteen arrangements and comes in different ways he may not come and stand in front of us as dhanavantri or mohini murti 
but in different different ways according to our karma and our desire and our surrender in even in our ordinary lives he is always there for us trying to help send this help and send that help but we have to be able to start seeing it it's like you develop different radar and antennae and you start seeing things from a spiritual perspective keep away from materialistic people who constantly are trapped like the demons always in their own domestic wrangling and fighting they don't want to learn or evolve the minute we have turned our face to the lord it means we are interested in learning about ourselves you know about where to go what to do how to do our, our duties best in a way that pleases the lord that is the mode of sacrifice like you correctly said sacrifice or yajna really means to please the lord what does it mean it doesn't necessarily mean that you starve and you rip yourself or you uh, yes sometimes it means giving up certain things certain things you like it may also mean doing in circumstances what is best what the lord will want us to do even if it is not really very pleasant for us to do it. this is also the spirit of sacrifice and often when the lord inside knows this he quickly changes our situation so that it becomes much more pleasant for us once we he sees we are willing to sacrifice our opinion about it so it's a great science this bhagavatam and the bhagavad gita and these leelas like you said the stories not only that they make interesting hearing there are so many lessons in it for us and you i mean if you hear from proper sources or we understand analyze properly there's so much rich learning that can happen even while our regular material lives are going on okay that's true we, yeah, you agree so yeah, much yeah. material so we conclude chapter 4 like this we looked at verse 11 that is i according to how each one reciprocates with me i surrenders to me i reward them accordingly then we looked at verse 31 which talks about how can anyone live in this world without accepting the value of sacrifice because basically it's a very unsure uh, uh, uncertain if we place the material world so always we have to be in some adjustment mode and the last thing we looked at is this list of different avatars and from that the particular churning of the milk ocean which comes in the eighth canto of the bhagavatam basically not just the mohini murti avatar and before that the dhanvantri avatar but bef- uh, also that he comes before that is the kurma avatar he then has a lesson to teach lord shiva which is also not to demean lord shiva this is the very glory of that whole thing finally lord shiva himself realizes his mistake and he moves out of that trance of obsession for the woman and he does he returns to the lord and pays obeisances and the lord is so pleased that he has not turned egoistic and said how dare you tr- trick me and test me and make me look a fool or anything it doesn't show that at all he is grateful because this whole episode with mohini murti and his getting bewildered helped him understand what his position actually is is a with the lord this is another very vital lesson sometimes the lord arranges for us to get beaten in public beaten not physically beaten to be put down a peg to be shown up in a bad way and we have to take that as part of the education he is doling out because we can get puffed up the whole world is praising us everyone is full of you know glorification that's not really good for us and suddenly we come But, across someone who's and uh, shivas like uh, you know at the time when daksha kind of uh... like put him down no publicly and all that he said very publicly to shiva at the time that you know that you are amongst the lowest the demigods and you are you know you practice yeah. all these things you are all these ghosts and demons are uh, with you and stuff but the one yeah. uh, thing about shiva was that like what i guess daksha didn't realize is that shiva is always in that state of uh, trans he's in the yeah. transcendental bliss he's always yeah. like remembering like he, the reason why he got angry is because as daksha entered everybody else then like everybody else stood up except shiva and brahma so right. because That's... him being him being the son of brahma he kind of mm. said okay brahma not standing up is fine but why is shiva not standing up so he got very angry and then he said all right. these things and in the entire time no like uh, what was interesting is that like the followers of daksha were accusing the followers of shiva of being uh, you know in that mode of ignorance and the followers of uh, shiva also like Uh, you know and they were both cursing and counter cursing and in the entire time nobody realized that what shiva is in state is 
is that he, the reason why he didn't stand up is because he was meditating on krishna the whole time so while they were thinking of themselves so much he was always in the transcendental state of thinking of krishna that's the reason why he didn't stand up while daksha and all the other people they were all more interested in like performing the ceremonies and glorifying um, like uh, the demigods for various reasons or also for their own you know material purposes or whatever and all that and uh, daksha was more concerned at that time about his prestige about his very standing was and then finally and even during all of that like when he insulted shiva like shiva didn't take it seriously it is only when uh, and you know and even his wife sati also said things like you know when she when later on there was another ceremony that was happening and when all all the heavenly people were all uh, like you know uh, you know getting ready to go for the ceremony she wanted to go along so she said you know let's go together she was said no i can't go there because um, you know my- yeah because daksha what doesn't like me like basically doesn't like me he doesn't want to see me so then uh, he- so yeah yeah and so then sati said then you know then basically she her understanding is that you know like why is shiva getting so upset but shiva knows that like you know it's like you know like i have not done like you know it's is that i am um i am free from all this my only thing is my thought is on krishna the whole time and i am like you know sh- you know i don't uh, you know like uh, what one person says is not a big uh, is not a you know it's i it these words yeah it doesn't affect me in any way and all that stuff and you know because krishna the the supreme lord knows everything that I, that, that that i need to know so then she goes she's like she goes back to the ceremony and then then there is where she when she re- comes there she realizes what shiva tells her also that if you go they will not receive you the way that you think they will receive you they will know that you are my wife and they won't receive you the same way so then she anyways goes and is exactly what happens and nobody receives her the ways that she wants them to be received. she wants everybody to like say how how are you i i you good this that and nobody says hello to her and so then she gets very upset then she realizes that these people are all, all are basically insulting shiva and then she puts herself in fire and then she just she gets she she literally like gives it back to daksha and she says she says something like you know i'm i i can't imagine that i was born from you so i need to destroy this body so that i can yeah. be free from the sin or something like that she goes very like she goes to the complete other side when she I dies see. extreme when she dies that is when shiva gets like angry he gets very upset he gets, yeah. and then he is almost about destroy the world there is thing uh, he takes one hair from this thing from that a demon gets sprouted and that demon is all just going around trying to destroy everything and like yeah. daksha has been like cursed that he will be his head will be cut off and then right. in the process his head is cut off then ship then all Lord, the brahmins the- they all they all go with Bra- brahma to shiva's uh, place in uh, kailash they pray to him and they said yeah no that's fine they can get all that back he is not at all affected he's teaching people like narad and all that about the okay. uh, spiritual journeys and all that stuff so he's not at all affected by what is happening but mm. that is, that story is like interesting how people kind of um, um, you know like how, how they assume based on external forms that somebody who looks like because shiva is like he's wearing is completely covered with the ash of all the dead souls that's right and okay. and he's got yeah. anantanag around his neck and uh, like you know anantanag itself is like that uh, uh, is an incarnation of the supreme personality of god and it's that what it's what gives shiva the power to destroy everything in the existence so right. so that is like nobody understands that so they just assume that that external wise he's just like that's you know right. he's not Eternal. he's not worthy Yeah. they missed the interview absolutely yeah. so, great story you know in varanasi if you ever go to kashi there are whole ghats named after the body parts that fell down when um, daksha when uh, parvati set fire immolated herself or died so there is a manikarnika ghat there is supposed to be a ghat where manikarna means a earring of the karna a jewel from the ears or karna fell down and then there is uh, i'm not getting the names now but manikarn is one of the most famous 
like that uh, this varanasi the god naming is completely tied around this whole episode of finally parvati giving up her life and a very distraught lord shiva reacting and carrying or uh, taking the remains and different parts falling and blessing that area so varanasi kashi uh, also is a great place to go to revive uh, many of these these stories to live them and um, so we'll end this chapter for here now yeah, and sure. yeah. yeah okay it's and what we will do is as i told you this thursday friday i'm going to be busy because it's the um uh, appearance day of lord chaitanya mahaprabhu and we have extra work but following week thursday we are going to be starting chapter 5 okay yeah. and chapter 5 and once march is over we are going to get back to weekly weekly without any any break in between march yeah. is still busy there are like financial dealings with the builder and then there is this uh, gaur gaurapurnima coming up that's why i am making this arrangement that's all yeah? wrong that's fine yeah keep reading and we'll stay in touch and you share okay. anything i already have a couple of things i'm going to send you when you're talking about lord shiva this this incident i, I it just occurred to me later today or tomorrow i'll send you that like two pictures okay. of two and deities okay so all right more more the better <laughs> i know very happy that you are happy reading and learning yeah. so much giving so me I'll this just, chance i'll just end this recording just uh, yeah thanks <laughs>